Okay, uh, welcome back to the last day of week one. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here after uh, all the kind of preliminaries that uh, we have been dealing with. And uh, um, I want, I hope as, a, as you see the talk progress, then uh, um, the work that I'm about to talk, I mean, really is, first of all, it's in collaboration with uh, Johannes and Lorenzo, who both over here. But throughout the rest of the talk, you will see the names of various other people here who um, yeah, their work is also sort of integral to, to the work that I want to talk about here. Uh, and it's also, you will also see that uh, you know, there really has been inspiration from the physics side. And uh, so you know, I, I think that uh, this, this, this can serve as hopefully some kind of model for the kind of thing that we can achieve during the collaboration. So, so co collapse and special holonomy is a rather general, and I think that probably Simon's talk this afternoon will also be uh, in a similar spirit. But uh, mine is about a uh, very particular point of view that's more closely related to uh, what Lorenzo talked about yesterday. So I just want to just set back straight in your mind, or for the couple of people that missed Lorenzo's talk, just uh, recall some of the basic uh, features. But there we were looking at collapse in families of hypercalar metrics on the K3, but where it's sort of a co-dimension one collapse that you end up with a limit space that's three-dimensional instead of four-dimensional. And so I want to go back through this and sort of pick out what the key ingredients were and then think about the same analogs of the same sort of thing in the G2 world and uh, discuss what we actually have already done about this and uh, what remains to be done uh, in this. And uh, so you'll see sort of uh, these, are, these are some of the main themes that will come up. So uh, I, I will explain all of what these things are. I also want to stress that uh, this notion of, of co-dimension one collapse in families of G2 holonomy metrics is intimately linked to physics that Bobby talked about. And uh, uh, in the physics, then I think you will see this if you, it's a weak coupling limit of M theory where you get type 2A theory with orientifolds. And, uh, so in some sense, this is beginning to make precise some sort of uh, link between, in the end, Calabial geometry and uh, G2 geometry. But I think there's a lot. This is really just the beginning. And uh, um, I, hope, I hope to hear from more from the physics side as well as to uh, what else we can expect. So what, what Lorenzo... Uh, the theorem that Lorenzo talked about yesterday was the following. So, uh, so the on, I mean, we know that the K the K three surface has uh, Ricci flat metrics thanks to Yao, but we want to understand possible degenerations, and one possible degeneration is uh, where you're going to have a limit space that's three dimensional. It's a flat orbifold T three mod Z2. This has eight fixed points. And so then what we're going to do is at each of these eight fixed points, then we need to glue in something. Uh, well, so first of all, we, we're going, well, let's just say that. So we have these gravitational instances, on, so complete hypercalar metrics, four-dimensional with uh, finite L2 curvature and ALF will mean this uh, uh, cubic volume growth rather than the possibly more familiar ALE where you have Euclidean volume growth. So then we need two distinct types of ALF spaces, the uh, so-called dihedral types modeled on uh, 
the binary dihedral groups in SU2, and then the slightly easier ones, the ALF spaces of cyclic type or multi-tailed nut. And uh, what, what you need is that you need to take uh, eight dihedral ALF spaces. Those are going to be glued in at each of the eight fixed points. Then we're allowed the freedom to have some extra points. And then at those extra points, we're going to add a multi-tailed nut matrix. And one needs to do it in a way to satisfy the obvious constraint that the Euler characteristic of the resulting thing is the same as the Euler characteristic of K3. And then what Lorenzo proves is that uh, any time you have such a collection of uh, dihedral ALFs and, and multi-tailed nuts satisfying this condition, then in fact it arises as a collection of bubbles in a sequence of, of hypercalar metrics on the K3. And uh, you know, the curvature is bounded away from these so eight worth of fixed points plus this extra n, possibly n extra points. Okay. So, and Lorenzo talked about that, in fact, if you vary all the parameters in this, then you really do get uh, a 58-dimensional family uh, this way. So just, just to recall, so because we're going to generalize this later, so, so we had ALF meant that outside a compact set, uh, then we had a finite group of O3 acting freely down on S2, so that outside that, it was the total space of a circle vibration over a, an exterior domain in R3, mod gamma, and that the metric became asymptotic to this submersion metric, so the pullback of the R3 mod gamma plus some fixed connection term plus decaying thing. Uh, so, so these will have uh, cubic volume growth rather than uh, Euclidean volume growth. And no, that's what I'm saying. There's only those, but you've got the choice of line bundle also. So you, if you take any bi binary dihedral group, and then that will give you a different. I mean, we we really only want to fix the difference between those two and otherwise you just change the line bundle. Uh, so, so we've only got, the, as Dominic says, you've only got these two. Either you're, you're downstairs, you're either uh, S2 or RP2. Um, so, uh, so we, we want to distinguish those. So as I said, the multi-tailed nuts, they all give ALF gravitational instantons and of cyclic type, and in fact, the converse is, was proved by Minerb. So in particular, all of these things arise from the gibbons hawking ansatz, which makes them reasonably easy to construct. On the other hand, the ALF spaces of dihedral type are a bit more complicated to construct. They don't arise from the gibbons hawking ansatz, sort of except asymptotically. Um, and the, there's a family of them, and then there are sort of two exceptional members of the family, the Atiyah Hitchin manifold and its double cover that we label D0 and D1, but they turn out to be vital to the previous gluing construction uh, in the sense that if you didn't have those, then uh, the only thing that would have been allowed was, uh, you know, Lorenzo started by talking about, you could start with the Kuma construction, take the Kuma construction for a family of split tori where now you imagine taking the length of one of the factors to zero, and then you get a, so, uh, this page hitch in uh, D2 ALFs occurring. And that would be the only thing that would be allowed if we didn't have these uh, D0 and D1, because in some sense they, they have an effective negative charge. Um, so this was one of the key things that we learned from talking to Bobby, where uh, Bobby said, of course, what you need is an orientifold. We said, what's an orientifold? And he said, well, it's the Atiyah Hitchin manifold. And uh, after that, uh, really, we, we, re we really started to understand a bit better what's going on. So I don't pretend to understand exactly on the physics side what's going on, but, but on the math side. 
So, so the so the main ingredients of the proof are the following. So, uh, we we're imagining trying to find something that was highly collapsed. So, the the general collapse theory would would make you think that very close to collapse, then you should be very close to having something circle invariant. Uh, so, so on the bulk of your of your space, you think there should be something circle invariant. So, you're going to take your three torus that's now punctured, the eight fixed points plus the extra points that you took away, and you want to construct inver S1 invariant hyperkähler matrix on that, and then you use the Gibbons Hawking ansatz to do that. But this, these will be incomplete, or they actually don't even extend to the whole uh, punctured torus. So you're fixing this involution, it has fixed points. You choose this uh, uh, extra n points, but they need to be z2 invariant. So you have 2n plus 8 points. And then you're going to construct a solution, uh, uh, so a monopole with Dirac type singularities at these points. And then you need to pass to this quotient. And so then this gives you something incomplete. To complete it, to get something that will be approximately hyperkähler, then at each of these eight fixed points, you glue in one of these dihedral ALF spaces. And so this, because you're taking this quotient, this extra Z2 that we talked about as infinity, this is needed. And then the cyclic ones go in at all the other points that are not fixed. So this allows you to construct, uh, as Lorenzo explained, uh, a closed definite triple so some form of approximately hyperkähler, uh, and then you can deform using implicit function theorem that using the fact that you've got a good sort of linearized theory. So, so the main ingredients were you know, a good perturbation theory for closed definite triples that are close to hyperkähler. The gibbons hawking ansatz gets used uh, sort of all over the place. So it was used to construct the ALF gravitational instantons. It's used to construct the incomplete metric on your punctured torus on some circle bundle over your punctured torus. And in fact, it also provides a good approximation to the asymptotic geometry of the dihedral spaces once you've passed to a double cup. And so then you need also ALF spaces, not just of, of uh, cyclic type, you need these ones of dihedral type, possibly including some analogs of these exceptional ones, the Atiyah Hitchin manifold and its double cover. So what we, what we would uh, like to do is to develop analogs of these key features in the G2 case. Mm -hmm. Even to give you something then that the 10 gives you something where you have a constant plus something times R inverse. Give the negative charge thing, meaning that you get a negative copy times R inverse. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it becomes asymptotic to a, a quote, tau nut of negative mass. And then you, you want some mass of to zero. Then. Yeah, I mean, uh, in order to, you know, I mean, in terms of finding the harmonic function, then um, if you only had positive mass things, it would force everything to go up to plus infinity, or, and you would, you would find that you could, the only thing you could do was to take a harmonic function that was constant. So you have to take something that's allowed to blow up and to plus or minus infinity. So, I mean, exactly how to state the same thing in, in the special Lagrangian world is, I mean, in the G2 Columbia world is not so clear to me, but uh, it, it's it's very you see it very clearly uh, in in the K3 world. Um, okay. So so a good perturbation theory for closed definite triples. Well, we don't need to do very much in the G2 world there because Dominic has already uh, uh, provided the tools in the sense that. Uh, we already have a, a very general perturbation theory for
close G2 structures with sufficiently small torsion, and small tweaks of that are going to be sort of sufficient. So, so, so one thing is good. We have to do all the rest now. So we need the ALF. We need analogs of gravitational instantons of cyclic and dihedral type. We need analogs of, of this incomplete S1 invariant metric on some circle bundle over the punctured torus. But uh, I mean, so we were sort of implicitly using that uh, T3 had a, well, had a flat metric, so it had a Ricci flat metric. And uh, you know, this, this involution, isometric involution, tau, was also playing a fundamental role here. So, so we think of you know, this, the, this thing here is giving us a background metric that's sort of singular or incomplete, and then we glue in these types of different ingredients to get those are the, the hypercalar bubbles, and you know, they're distinguished according to you know, what the, behave, the behavior of the points were under the involution. Okay, so, so, so far I'm really just repeating what Lorenzo said yesterday with a particular emphasis for the G2 world. Okay. So, so the first thing is what's, what's the correct G2 analog of an ALF gravitational instanton? And we've already heard something about what the answer is in Johannes's talk, but uh, now you'll sort of see part of the reason for uh, our interest. So, so the the kind of analog of a of a ALF space in high dimensions is well, it was it was named by it was named by the physicists uh, um, an ALC manifold. It's not a name I'm particularly fond of, but it seems to have stuck. So, um, so ALC is for asymptotically locally conical. I don't really think that's a very descriptive word, but. Uh, uh, you'll see it, it generalizes ALF in a natural way. So, so I start off with some closed, and in our case, because of Ricci flat connected, Riemannian manifold. So this is going to be a dimension n minus 2. Over that, I take a circle bundle. At the beginning, I don't necessarily assume it's principal, but if I pass your double coverer, then up to some other things, I might as well assume that I've got a principal bundle. And then I want a connection form on my principal bundle and, and a positive constant that will give me a length. And this data is going to give me a sort of model metric. So I, you want to think of the analogy with, uh, uh, you know, say, asymptotically conical things. So, so it's still topologically you know, R across this end, so it still looks like a cone. But I'm not going to give it that metric anymore. So instead, I, I give it a sort of cone metric here. But then on, on the vibration thing, vibration directions, then, then I just give it this L. So the way that you should think of this is that I've, I've got a circle bundle over a cone, but with the circles uh, of constant length. So, so we want to think of this as the possible asymptotic model for our ALC space. Uh, so, so then a complete Riemannian manifold, again, one end is just because that's all we're going to encounter in the Ricci flat case. We could allow things more generally. So it, it, should, be some, it should be a Riemannian manifold that becomes asymptotic to this model with some rate. So again, take away some compact set, some R, to tell me the right exterior domain to work with, possibly work up to a double cover. Then there's a diffeomorphism from uh, sort of an exterior domain in this to the complement of this compact set, so that measured with respect to the model at infinity, then uh, the, the difference between those two metrics uh, decays with some, with some negative rate and then depending on the number of derivatives that you're taking. And uh, I mean, if you're going to be in the ALC Ricci flat world, then you won't need to require much of this before elliptic regularity should make it 
automatic for all higher derivatives. So if I take n to be 4, little n to be 4, and big N to be S3 mod gamma, where gamma is a cyclic or a binary, binary dihedral group, then my sigma will be S2 or RP2, respectively, and this reduces to ALF. Um, okay. So, but, so one, one can develop in the same way that uh, analysis on AL, on asymptotically conical manifolds exists, you can develop analysis on ALC manifolds, and uh, we have we have done that, but uh, I'll return to that later. But for now, we're interested in the particular case of ALC G2 manifolds, and so then we should uh, specify some more information. Uh, so as, as we well know, then we will we want to think about a closed and co-closed three-form. So if my ALC manifold has G2 holonomy, we expect that the model data at infinity should satisfy some sort of further constraints. In particular, it probably should include a model three-form. So it also should constrain what the possible cones are. So the, the, natural, uh, the natural assumption to make at the beginning would be that... Uh, the cone should be a Calabi-Yau cone. So that means the sigma should be a Sasaki-Einstein five-manifold. And once you have a conical Calabi-Yau structure, then if you, if you further constrain the connection uh, that you're specifying on this circle bundle over the cone to be Hermitian-Yang-Mills, then, then so you have an obvious G2 structure, which sort of the obvious thing for what you would do just by taking the thing to be a product. Uh, but in general, if you make this Hermitian yang mills that will be co-closed, but not closed. But we know that uh, deformation theory is sort of good for closed things, so one prefers to add a correction term to force it to be closed, but no longer co-closed, but sort of a small torsion asymptotic. So Basically, you just see what the error to the thing that stopped this being closed and realize that actually it's, it's a, a, it has a primitive which you can subtract off. So if, if you take the contact one form on, on your Sasaki-Einstein and subtract this, then you can make, you make this closed. So, but it's still not. But un, unlike the case of, of a the asymptotically conical world, then your model is not exactly uh, G2 holonomy. So it's, it, has a G2, it has a closed G2 structure with sort of decaying torsion. Okay. So, well, so how, how would you, how could you try to construct ALC G2 manifolds? Well, you already heard a little bit in Johannes' talk, so, uh, one thing is just impose extra symmetries. Uh, in particular, impose so many symmetries that things reduce to an ODE problem. Try to deal with the resulting ODEs directly. So uh, this, well, so you've heard some results in that direction. So uh, this was pioneered by uh, various physicists, including uh, Sergei. Um, uh, in in a sort of explosion of activity between 2001 and 2005. Um, so uh, the continuous part of the group acting is always either SU2 cross SU2 or possibly SU2 cross SU2 with an extra U1. And uh, so one explicit ALC G2 metric was found by Sergei and collaborators in 2001. And there was numerical evidence for a two-parameter family of these two parameters, including the scalings, and uh, the physicists call this family B7. But uh, apart from this one explicit one, then at the time, this really was just numerical evidence based on, on solving, the, solving the ODEs numerically from, from some uh, initial value, singular initial value problem. So 
it is possible. So, uh, uh, Olga Bogayalenskia, a uh, student of Bazaikin, uh, rigorously proved the existence of this family just by studying the ODEs directly, so not, not, by exib not by being able to write down a closed form, but by qualitative analysis. And uh, in that case, the extra U1 it plays a key role in sort of reducing the complexity of the problem. And, but there's a different way to think about it, which is, which is more in keeping with the uh, philosophy of today's talk. So the, the two parameters, uh, geometrically, they control the size of the exceptional orbit, which is, in this case, always around three-sphere, and the length of the asymptotic circle. So in, in this parameter space, then geometric degenerations occur at special points. So Johannes discussed sort of two of those. So uh, depending on how you scale things, then uh, what you can imagine is that uh, um, if you, if you rescale things to try and keep the S3 of fixed size, then as you vary, what happens is the size of the circle keeps changing, and eventually the size of the circle gets larger and larger and larger, and then there's some limit where the circle is no longer a finite length asymptotically, but is infinite length, and you converge to the standard asymptotically conical Bryant-Salomon solution. But you could instead try to control things so that you keep the size of the asymptotic circle fixed. And then essentially you're forcing the three sphere to get smaller and smaller. And when you do that, you take a limit in the right way. You get this con conically singular uh, ALC space that Johannes discussed. So I think you know, the, the AC limit had been sort of remarked on by physicists, but thinking of it in terms of this alternative conically singular picture had, had been missed, I think, and uh, I think it's a useful way to organize things that uh, uh, it, it, it gives you a sort of unifying perspective that I probably won't have time to say too much about today because instead I want to concentrate on this collapse limit. So you know, the other possibility is that you're going to allow the size of your circles to shrink and uh, asymptotic circles to shrink. And so then you expect that there's a collapse limit where this ALC G2 manifold, gromov hausdorff converges to some non-compact collab, yeah. So, yeah. But it, it's a, yeah, it's, I, it, it's just convenient to be able to sort of separately talk about the size of those two, but yeah, up to scale, there's just the one parameter family. So it's sort of an interval at the two ends of the interval. One is either the AC or the conically singular one, depending on how you normalize things. The other end is this collapse limit. It's the ratio that's the important thing. Um, so originally, I wrote the whole slide with, a, with one thing in it, but I mean, somehow to talk about both the AC limit and the conically singular thing, uh, it's somehow more convenient to imagine both parameters. But yeah, there's, a, there's a, a, essentially a one-dimensional moduli space of those things, which has it's ALC in the interior, and then it has this AC, so, or maybe a conically singular ALC at one end, and this, this collapse limit at the other. So if, so, so, so now, given, given that our eventual goal, my pointer is getting a bit puny, oh, there we go. Uh, given that our goal in the end is to try to construct uh, let's say compact G2 manifolds close to a collapse limit, uh, doesn't seem so unreasonable to try to construct these ALC things by looking at their collapse limits. So, so, so the, the, the second method to try to construct ALC rather, rather than just look for very symmetric things is, is try to establish how to go from a kind of collapse limit backwards. So in, in the B7 family, then what, what was expected was that uh, you should see collapse to this uh, standard, so on, on the smoothing of the conifold, which is a cotangent bundle, diffeomorphic to the cotangent bundle of S3, then there's a standard 
asymptotically conical Calabiao metric due to Candelas de la Osa and Stenzel. And we expect to see collapse to that metric. And uh, I mean, there's also very st recently work by, by Ronan Conlon and, and Hayo Hine showing sort of a very strong uniqueness property of, of, of this metric. Um, so again, this general expectation from, from the theory of collapse in our, in our case, our manifold should be composed of pieces that, that are sort of asymptotically invariant under a isometric circle action. So, you know, in, in the hypercalar case, that was exactly what the Gibbons Hawking ansatz was, was sort of going to be good for. Uh, so, so we had, you know, so, so we had hypercalar if and, uh, and circle invariant where, where the U1 preserves all the whole hypercalar triple if and only if this was uh, the pair H and, and the connection theta satisfy these abelian monopole equations. So, uh, so, I mean, this is you know, this, this is an amazing thing because it, it reduces this hyper, the hypercalar condition just essentially to uh, solving the Laplacian plus then usually arranging you've got some topological constraints to satisfy. Uh, but you know, if you were on R three, you could have written those down explicitly. But when we were on T three, we just could appeal to general theory about solutions to, to the Laplacian on a Riemannian manifold. So we would like some G2 analog of this, but it's, 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 it's a tough ask. Uh, but so uh, as I, I promised that uh, various collaborators would appear, so Simon Salomon takes the stage now. And uh, in 2004, then, and together with uh, Vestislav Apostolov, then Simon considered G2 holonomy metrics, which are circle invariant that leave the three form invariant. So, so the, this is a slightly adjusted presentation of the same thing. But uh, so again, you've got a principal bundle over some base and a connection on that. And now, on the on the base, you want uh, an SU3 structure, but the SU3 structure is not. Uh, there's a func there's another there's a positive function involved to sort of make this an SU3 structure. With some power of it that's convenient for other purposes that I won't explain today. Um, but then we define a G2 structure on on this the same the same way as we did before. So this then has uh, induced metric this, which looks sort of somewhat analogous to the gibbons hawking type ansatz. And then uh, if we do that, then the four form turns out to be this. And so then uh, uh, you can write down equations for when this is a, when this is a S1 invariant torsion-free G2 structure, and you get the following uh, system of equations, which, which does not look as simple as just uh, uh, trying to solve a harmonic for a harmonic function. Uh, sorry, B, I think I changed notation at some stage where B was a base, so B is, sorry? P is M, right? Uh, P is M, yeah. P was a principal circle, but became M, yeah. And GM is then GY? This is GY, sorry, yes. Apologies for the confusion. So, but if it, for what we need, we, we need a lot less than the Gibbons Hawking ansatz because we're thinking about things in the collapse limit. And so the, the Gibbons Hawking ansatz was doing something, you know, didn't, it didn't matter whether the circles were small or not. So if instead we imagine a family of things that are close to a collapse limit, then what we can attempt to do is to take these equations and perform some sort of linearization of them uh, close to that collapse limit. And, and that's going to be enough 
for what we want. I mean, it's not going to be as powerful as the Gibbons Hawking ansatz, but these equations are too complicated to deal with in general. So. Yeah. So you can introduce some parameters. You start to see uh, equations that would look like this. So um, if I take some sort of formal limit where epsilon goes to zero, then you can see things like, uh, uh, well, I have to argue separately about h, but suppose that h becomes constant, then, uh, so first of all, I'll get now that this is, so d of the real part is zero, d of the imaginary part is zero. Um, so it takes some massaging this, but uh, the, the upshot is exactly what Dominic said, that uh, what you should imagine as, as, as the right limit is that this h is asymptotically constant, and then you, what you get is a Calabial structure of y. But then, then, then you want to go sort of one step beyond that. And so you linearize, but now assuming that this background is a Calabial. And then you, you get precisely a Calabial monopole on y together with an additional three form that satisfies equations, linear equations like this. So, so the Calabial monopole equation arises as the dimensional reduction of the G2 instanton equation, just as the ordinary monopole equation did in the four-dimensional instanton case. And uh, Gonzalo's thesis with Simon was about uh, Calabial and G2 monopoles. Uh, so, so a special case would be, uh, again, when H... Uh, is identically one even after even after this next uh, stage of improvement, and theta is a Hermitian Yang Mills connection. But uh, in general, what you should imagine is that uh, your Calabial monopoles may be allowed to have direct type singularities along special Lagrangian submanifolds. So. Yeah, so everything's abelian. Um, so what, what you end up seeing is that uh, if you solve those equations, then it does, give, it does give to you a closed ALC G2 structure with small torsion uh, on your manifold. And so it makes it at least conceivable that, that you can use the perturbation theory framework to to, uh, to correct to exactly G2 holonomy. So the things that you can get this way, certainly at the moment, uh, so for example, you could take your Calabial to be the canonical of P1 cross P1, or you take the small resolution of the conifold, then there are appropriate Hermitian-Yang-Mills connections on the appropriate circle bundles over those. Instead, on, on the cotangent bundle of S3, then there's a Calabial monopole that has direct singularities along the special Lagrangian S3. So, so from what I said, you can then find G2, closed G2 structures with small torsion on circle bundles over these. So it turns out you have to do a little bit better that uh, at least in Dominic's in Dominic's perturbation theory, things need to, to be in L2, and you're not quite in L2, so you need to do a bit of uh, tweaking of the approximate solutions by hand near infinity to, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm simplifying slightly, but uh, this is morally the correct statement. But uh, you, need, you need to improve the decay of the torsion a little bit, and you can do that by hand, at least in those cases. And so you can then deform to exact ALC G2 manifolds using Dominic's uh, deformation results. Of course, you, know, you need to do some analysis on ALC spaces. So this is where that first comes in. 
Um, also, uh, once you've got one of these, then again, you might want to, you know, we thought that they came in families, so we'd like to uh, understand, say, the deformation theory of ALC G2 manifolds. So in the AC case, that was achieved by Jason Lotte and Spiro Caragiannis, who was here until yesterday. And uh, once you have Fredholm theory and uh, understanding of initial roots on ALC manifolds, you can go and, and do a ALC version of that story. So this Lagrangian Dirac singularity has normal bundle or normal direction, which is modeled on its own map. Yes. So from the seven dimensional point of view, this is co dimension four at the generation point of the first line. So one could imagine that along this special Lagrangian Dirac singularity, you could have co dimension six singularities at some special points. Is it ruled out somehow? Or um, I mean, I, I don't think it's a priori. Well, we, we're imagining things that w you know, we still preserved some of the symmetries there, and so certainly that's not going to happen there. But uh, um, I mean, in a general construction, there's not much we could say at the moment. Um, Uh, I mean, you need to have, so you could look at something that was just a product. But no, uh, what I'm saying is you, you need to have some H2 in order to have a non-trivial circle bundle. So, okay, so like the ALE comes the, the bundle. Uh, then there will be like, sorry. I'm, I'm, they don't have the... Mm-hmm. But the link, the link is S5 mod, so it doesn't have any H2. So you, you need H2 of, you need H, you need this thing to sort of live at infinity. Um, so this is why AL, so ALE things will only give rise to sort of, you know, trivial degenerations of just a circle. To, uh, so you need something. Okay. So uh, as a result, then, uh, by doing this, then uh, you do get three families of, of ALC G2 manifolds where you have a, <clears throat> they have a circle, action, uh, circle action. So the, we're constructing things in this limit where the asymptotic length of this circle is, is very small. So this, this is a table that's describing what's the gromov hausdorff limit in these three families? And then what's the dimension of the moduli space of ALC G2 manifolds, modulo scalings now? And then what's this rate? Uh, um, well, it's actually, it's a slightly different notion of rate from what I said before. But. So, so this, this gives an alternative way to think about the sort of three of the families that the physicists thought about uh, by going to this collapse limit. And this is, this is sort of probably the right point of view for, for, for the applications that we talked about. OK. So, so the, these will be, I mean, you, you would in general like to understand, you know, given a Calabi-Yau cone, together with some additional data, exactly when can I construct an ALC G2 that collapses to that. And that's something that we're still thinking about in general. But in, in these cases, then uh, you can certainly make this work. So we do need to say a bit more about ALC. But for the moment, let's now try and transition to the uh, uh, compact case. So, um, so, so in, in this B7, then uh, we, we could try to imagine using these collapsed B7s as, as bubbles in a gluing construction. So in this case, there, there is this global circle action. And as Sergei said, this has a, uh, it fixes the exceptional orbit. And then in the limit, then this converges to Stenzel metric on, on the smoothing of the conifer. So 
to pass to the compact constructions, we have to maybe start by asking, well, what, what's the right replacement for T3 mod Z2 in the G2 world? And the natural thing to start with uh, is really a replace your T3 with the Calabi-Yau threefold and replace your involution with some anti-holomorphic involution. And then the fixed point set will be totally geodesic, special Lagrangian, not necessarily connected. So, but we have models for uh, you know, a special Lagrangian if, with something very collapsed close to it, if it's, if it's a three sphere and it's round. But uh, in general, if I just take a Calabi Yau with an anti-holomorphic involution, then I don't know anything about the topology typically, and I certainly don't know something about the intrinsic metric geometry. So, so this, so this by itself would would not be very helpful there. But so, so how do we find round special Lagrangian three spheres? And uh, here. Song, Song's talk today is going to uh, save the day. So this also links to what Dave was talking about. So if I start with a Calabi-Yau threefold that was singular and that had only ordinary double point singularities and assume that you can smooth it. So at the moment, I don't. this is, this is not a metric statement yet, but... Uh, um, if it's smoothable, then uh, you have these vanishing cycles that are exactly going to be S3s. And uh, what you would really like to know is that those are sort of asymptotically round special Lagrangian S3s. So this was something that Dominic and uh, uh, one of his former students, Yat Ming Chan, thought about. And what they realized was that, I mean, if you really knew that that uh, your threefold x0 actually had uh, incomplete calabi metric that really became asymptotic to the standard model for the conical metric on the conifold, then you could glue in. Uh, you could glue in Stenzel. Stenzel has these round, totally geodesic S3s, and uh, so you can, you can get something uh, um, that will do the job for us. Uh, but it took a long time, I mean, it took a long time for, to establish this, and so now, thanks to work of, of Song and, and uh, Hayao from July this year, um, then we, not, 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 not just in this case, but in some other cases too, then we do exactly have this. So I, uh, I think this is really a great result that, uh, um, you know, it, Kayla Ricci flat. So, um, so as I said, once, once you've got that, then you glue in, and then you can get three spheres that are special Lagrangian, and you know, they're as close to round as you want by going far enough back towards the singularity. I'm just guessing, you start with a vanilla Calabi-Yau 3, you smooth it a little bit, you get the metric where you now know you have these round things. Then you glue your ALF things into kind of circle bundle over something to Calabi-Yau 3. Wouldn't it be simpler just to stick with noble Calabi-Yau 3 with its nice metric, get your circle bundle over that, and then glue in what has the bloom is this wire star and thing over S3 to that? We have entertained both. We're, we're pursuing both points of view, but uh, um, for presentational purposes, with the link with ALC, it was most convenient to emphasize this. But, yeah. Um, so, it's still, but, so, we're, we're not there yet either in that, uh, first of all, we need to find suitable nodal uh, club Yao, so we, we want something where the, um, where the anti-holomorphic involution actually has a fixed set that's a subset of the nodes, that's a quite restrictive uh, condition, right, which I have 
have uh, asked uh, Dave if he had any uh, general uh, thoughts about, but uh, not so far not the case. But uh, we also need, because we need to find an appropriate circle bundle, uh, and we need to lift the involution to the circle bundle, then we will also need the existence of a divisor that passes through the nodes of x in a specified way. So we do know at least one such nodal uh, Calabi R threefold. I will not describe it today, but if you want a description, then Johannes is the best person to ask. Um, so now, as a result of this, we will be able to, on the total space of the right circle bundle over a sort of punctured version, or take away the special Lagrangians, then you can construct a highly collapsed circle invariant approximately G2 metric, essentially again by uh, using this linearized version of Apostolov Salomon. And uh, in fact, so then, but you still need to solve that, those equations. But uh, after, after staring at the equations for a while, then uh, uh, Lorenzo realized that, in fact, if you go back to Nigel Hitchin's work on gerbs and threefolds, then, in fact, more or less, uh, the, some equation that he solved in that case uh, amounts to solving this equation in in disguise, slightly in disguise. And uh, so, so you can do this on the complement of a homologically trivial set of compact disjoint special Lagrangians. So the argument in the end is sort of very ingenious. It's a Hodge theory for currents, plus then you start decomposing everything into type repeatedly and uh, um, you know, you need to use the fact that these things were special Lagrangian also to do this. So, um, so you, you really, you, you start to see where special Lagrangian plays a role, um, but in the end it's, it's, it's Hodge theory for current plus this type decomposition. So uh, we're still missing one ingredient, which is, you know, we had the sort of analogs of the cyclic, some analogs of the cyclic uh, ALF spaces, but we were still missing uh, the dihedral ones, and in particular, sort of Atiyah Hitchin. So uh, you know, again, in the ALF construction, we had two different sorts of points, the ones that were fixed by the involutions and the ones that weren't. So we've, we've got the model for the things for things that were not fixed by the involution. We need something for the ones that are fixed. So there, what you should imagine is what I need is a family of ALC G2 manifolds that instead collapses to stencil quotiented by its standard anti-holomorphic involution. So again, physics sort of inspired the uh, answer. So Fizz uh, had already suggested that there should be an M-theory lift of the atiyah hitchin manifold. So there should be some G2 manifold that kind of corresponded to atiyah hitchin And Hori and collaborators gave a concrete proposal for this where they again looked at cohomogeneity one solutions. So they considered a, a, a potential family A7 of these G2 manifolds. Um, and again, they studied these ODEs numerically. So once again, there is an SU2 times SU2 symmetry, but no longer this extra U1 symmetry. And so dealing with the ODE system directly uh, has, is much less tractable. But uh, again, if instead one takes the point of view of looking for the collapse limits, then, then you, can, you can approach this problem. But again, it becomes, it is more involved than in the previous cases in that uh, essentially what you need to do is to uh, find a better approximation to the geometry in the neighborhood of the singular orbit and uh, you, in order to do that, then the solution was sort of inspired by, uh, uh, you know, essentially what Simon is going to talk about, or part of what Simon is going to talk about this afternoon, that if you rescale appropriately in the normal directions, uh, then you pass to some limiting situation, 
And uh, uh, in this sense, it, physicists had written down various sort of statements where they said that these manifolds should be sort of a T, a hitch in matrix fibered over S3. This was clearly a statement that was true for these things as topological spaces. Uh, but it wasn't clear what the metric analog of that statement was. And in fact, this is, you know, it's really only an adiabatic. Uh, uh, so the, the geometry in the neighborhood of the principal orbit is in some sense uh, well understood by this. But then as you, as you go away from the geometry, as you go away from the exceptional orbit, then you transition to this circle bundle over a cone. So you really have to interpret this as, as an appropriate sort of adiabatic limit. OK, so I'm not going to claim a theorem at this stage, but now we believe that it should be possible to, to this is the final ingredient that you need in, in a gluing construction of collapse, compact collapse G2s collapsing to you know, a club Yau threefold that's close to uh, a conifold. As, uh, so we also have these other. Now, we have these conically singular ALC things as well. So if one were being optimistic, then you could also hope that you actually find families of singular G2 manifolds collapsing to the, um, to the conifold exactly. So both of those things are you know, works in you know, active development right now. And uh, hopefully, so we, we have a meeting in London in January, the theme is collapse in special holonomy. Hopefully, by that stage, we'll be able to report that this is a theorem rather than you know, a theorem that we hope to be true. Thanks. So far. So far. Uh, can you call, okay, so you had a, cross S1 mod Z2. Yeah. But so you needed a, a, a non-vanishing harmonic one form on special function. Is there anything like that occurring in these ideas? Not, not, I mean, so not really, no. I mean, uh, In this picture, is there any simultaneous? Or is there what? Any, any, anything that you, you, you can't really get? Or, or, or can you just start with some ingredient and, and hope you to go ahead and build a family of Well, so there are some restrictions. So, um, so, so for example, in this, I mean, the, the non-compact things are easier to think about. So. Um, the canonical of P1 cross P1, so that has the Calabi metric on it just from the Kahler Einstein metric on P1 cross P1. But because the Kahler cone there is two dimensional, then in fact there's, there's more, there are, there are other deformations of that. And um, so you can try to find, you can try to find ALC G2 things that are asymptotic to one of those. Uh, that, that turns out that. Uh, you, know, you solve some equation, you find some two form of the right properties, but then you also need to know that that two form arises as the curvature of some connection. And that imposes some integrality constraints or some rationality constraints. And so what you end up finding is there are, so rather than being continuous families of those things, then there's sort of uh, you know, rational worth of, of families uh, because of that extra condition. So. Um, so there, there will be some similar sorts of things, I think, that come in where you, know, you can solve the linear equations, but then you're going to you need an interpretation of those in terms of circle bundles or something, like, and there's going to be some 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 integrality constraints there. So so that's the that's definitely the kind of thing that we have already seen, um, and I mean some of these things you can also say maybe in terms of Gerb equivalence, as in uh, uh, as in uh, Nigel's paper, and so that may be, in some cases, 
difficult to check. Um, um, can you say again the reason that you need to, to divide on an even I mean, the, well, so for, from a sort of, I mean, one, one thing that you want to make sure you avoid is you don't want to have a global circle action. Because if you had a global isometric circle action, then you wouldn't have holonomy G2. So something has to come along somewhere to spoil the, uh, uh, not the singularity. So it's so it's so that so so for example when you take this B seven which has a fixed point, then uh, so you really don't have a circle bundle there, but you still have an S one action, and so that's not enough to spoil things. You really need to break uh, the uh, you need you need to not have a circle action, um, and so from 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 a one point of view that's 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 one interpretation. Bobby would would say, uh, you know, these things have these things are orientifolds. They have negative charge. All the other things have positive charge. You need something to, uh, you know, you need total charge to be zero because these are supersymmetric, and uh, so you need to have enough negative charge to cancel all the positive charge coming from the special Lagrangians that were not fixed points. I don't know how to make that statement uh, a rigorous mathematical statement. Yeah, but we don't have an you know, we we don't have well, we have Euler number zero, but this is not very helpful in seven dimensions. So, um, so yeah, I think it's it's a you know it's a good question as to how to. Um, I mean, you, you can see it from the point of view if you should avoid having a global uh, circle action, uh, but in terms of in terms of how do you actually see it, in the way that physicists see it, I think. That's a question we would like to answer during the collaboration. You don't have some, for example, this kind of some number of characteristics, some characteristic number of this circle bundle or whatever. We don't have an interpretation that way at the moment, no. I mean, you see something sort of trivially coming up in, in when you try to solve uh, these equations a la Hitchin that uh, you, know, you need a collection of special Lagrangians that was homologically trivial. Um, just, you know, there's just an obvious obstruction to solving for a current uh, supported on the union of those things. So you start to see things like this straight away. But, uh, um, but exactly the interaction of that with, with the things that are the fixed points as well is not quite so clear to us. Um, and, well, I should say, you know, there, potentially there is a much more general construction where you forget about ALC mainly and instead concentrate on this uh, uh, you know, more general special Lagrangians. And what you need to understand then is good models for uh, the asymptotic geometry close to a more general special Lagrangian. 
and then that should be something like uh, some sort of twisted. Uh, I mean, the, in the S3 case, then then you you see these tau nut vibrations or Atiyah tier Hitchin vibrations that are sort of uh, very symmetric, but in general they can vary. We sort of understand in the tau nut case more how they should vary, and you need to try to put those two things together. And potentially, that would remove the need to be close to uh, uh, you know, around special Lagrangian, where you know, the reason we needed that was because we were going to glue in the ALC directly. But that, that seems much further, af further off at the moment. But potentially, I mean, conversations with Bobby, then uh, Bobby doesn't seem to think for example, there's any reason that the physics would care about the special Lagrangian being around three sphere, for example. So can I try to restate Bobby's condition in slightly more mathematical language? Do you have a circle action with fixed points? Stay away from the fixed We don't have a circle. We, we will not have a global circle action. Sorry, you have an S1 bundle. Oh, sorry, it's not an S1 bundle. Away from the fixed points, it's an S1 bundle. Right? Yes. So there's a connection on there, which has a curvature independent of the choices which could be thought of as a, a, a two-point current on the base, which is not closed. So the closure of that should be a three-dimensional uh, three cycle. And that's the thing that, that is down. Two points in the in the model. So, 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 so that, that's exactly what Bobby said. So that's the, that's the negative or positive charge. You're assigning a charge to a fixed point uh, according to how that Well, I guess you have to link that to the solution behavior well, that, that solution. Is why, yeah. why, that's, why that's the necessary condition for the solutions. But, but the physics wisdom is that they should be. Yeah. Will you speak up a little? Maybe we'll be able to relate the entire construction to what's coming to the vibration. But we don't really, I mean, the problem is we don't really know the Calabia with that. So that. I think that's the most obvious. If, if, if you want to, to actually deal with metrics, if there's no way to do that. So it's a beautiful idea, but, but there's no technology. Yeah. So I mean, the, the point at the moment is this: you know, the technology exists to do this right. today, or maybe tomorrow, but uh, not uh, <laughs> not uh, in five years. Or, All right, thanks.